And uh, Jason will remind you that Florida State is not only 4-0, and but they might be the only team in the country with three wins against Power 5 teams. The biggest game of the year, I would say, to date, is coming up this Saturday, hopefully kicking off at 3.30 Eastern Time in Tallahassee on ABC. Wake Forest coming to town, coming off a disappointing, discouraging from the standpoint of final score against Clemson in overtime. we got Tony Syracuse on the line from Last Word on College Football to tell us about Wake. Tony. Guys, how are you doing tonight? Man, I apologize for that lead-in Mark gave you. I mean, let's let's welcome Tony. Tony, we had him in the offseason. <laughs> he's, he's a great guy, great commentator, great guy, and and – and Mark just shot you down like the first day of duck hunting season. Shot him down. Uh, no, Mark, Mark did all right. Tony, thank you for joining us, man. We appreciate it. First Glad of all, to I, do guess, it. I guess our first question from our side is, what is Wake's mindset right now at this point? Obviously, you know, Wake came in, started the season 4-0, and or 3-0, and disappointing game last week against Clemson. But they were still in it. Let's, let's give Wake Forest credit. They were in it with Clemson for the most part. They were oh, in it. They went to overtime. Oh, I was about to say, they were I'm in sorry, it, in it. They were in it, in it, dog. They were rolling. The game. We were pulling for them. They weren't, they weren't pulling. staying within 20 out. points. Mark, we were pulling for them. Mark, hear me out. They still lost. There's only winners and losers. There's not close ones. Well, there's, there's, there's a difference lost, between probably. in it and not in it. They, they, were, in they it. were in it to win it. Wow, you really need to take more power now. Some of your cliches are there. It's a solid. Logan brought his cliche. I've been, I've been rolling today. And you're good tonight here. But on a serious note, Tony, what what is Wake's mindset after after a disappointing loss? The way the way they lost against Clemson. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot to be seen, quite frankly, because the emotion after the game was very stark. Um, you saw guys like Michael Jurgens take the podium, the starting center take the podium in the post game press conference, fighting back tears because of of the loss in double overtime. You saw Sam Hartman take the podium he was the one player who hadn't even changed out of his uniform yet he he was you know still had that on and i think it's fair to say he was pissed he wasn't sad he was he was he was pissed he answered maybe three maybe four questions and we weren't done and he said you know what i don't want to do this anymore and walked off um i wouldn't call it a temper tantrum like some have he was just pissed and he didn't want to do it um, look, the week before they had a very close game against Liberty where they had to, you know, get a, two, get a stop on a two point conversion in the closing minutes of the game. And Hartman <laughs> wasn't exactly having fun after that one either. Gave himself a D grade on this one. He said, I failed. We lost. So I failed. Um, you know, it's hard to say when you had the kind of game he did. He threw six touchdown passes, which broke his own school record for touchdowns in a game. But you like the quarterback having that kind of mentality, putting the team on his shoulder, especially a guy who's been around as long as Hartman has. That having been said, look, Dave Clawson has a policy 24 hours. Deal with the game however you're going to deal with it. We're going to regroup on Sunday. We're going to watch some game film. We're going to start the prep for the next week. And we got to rally together. Now, when I say there's a lot to be determined, it's because as simple as that sounds, it didn't quite work that way after the Liberty game. He admitted that he had to pull the team together and remind them that they won. Because even on Sunday, there were a lot of heads hanging in the film room. And he told him, you guys won, and we're not going to do this. Was it clean? No. Was it pretty? No. Did you win? Yes. We'll fix what needs to be fixed and move on. But we're not going to be that team that hangs our heads after a win. Because you start doing that too much, and the game's no longer fun. So, you know, is he able to – now he's got to kind of rally them from the hurt and the pain. Because this was a team – that going into the Clemson game for the first time in several years, truly believed to a man they could beat Clemson. Mm -hmm. Um, They had the personnel to compete with Clemson. Clemson was shorthanded in the defensive secondary with some injuries. Of course, they were still missing Xavier Thomas. That makes a big difference. And to a man, Wake Forest believed they could do it. They got off to a slow start, like they are getting in a bad habit of doing, but they played well throughout the second half and and into the two overtimes, throughout the two overtimes. So when that last pass got knocked down in the end zone, it was was really 
deflating for them. So Clawson's job is not just to get them ready for an extremely difficult ACC opponent, but make sure their heads are in the right places. Make sure they're in the right headspace to you know to to move forward. And you know, look, we talked with him yesterday, Tuesday, and he said. They had a great practice on Tuesday. Everyone's really in it. They're really motivated. You expect the coach to say that, you know, but you need to physically see it. You need to see it come Saturday that this team has turned the page and wiped the Clemson game off their off their brains. That was a quick question for you. I, I apologize. I guess my question would be about Sam Hartman. Mm-hmm. Sam Hartman, when he started the season, he would he did not start the season. Right. Uh, because there was the medical issue, we talked about that. There were right. some people who wondered if it was the, you know, something to do with mental health. It yeah. Turns out it was a blood clot issue. Correct. But he is back now, and and I think that puts Wake Forest in serious competition. I think they can come in and beat Florida State. What what? How important is it right now for mm-hmm. Wake to have Sam Hartman back for the stretch of Clemson, for the stretch of playing Florida State, NC State? They've got later on. How important is it to have Sam Hartman back? It's everything. I, and I don't think that's an overstatement. Look, Mitch Griffiths, who is the future for Wake Forest at quarterback, is a good quarterback, very physically gifted, knows the offense. But there's something that you can't teach a Mitch Griffiths, and that is how to have the it factor, which you know I repeatedly say, which is what Hartman has. He walks into the huddle. It's his huddle. Everybody knows it. You don't need to say. You don't need to stake your claim. You, you're chewing out an offensive lineman. It's not, it's not a problem. It's not, you know, some guy saying, you know, who the heck are you to chew me out? It's Sam Hartman chewing me out. And Hartman has this ability, if you will, to treat everybody the same, good or bad. <laughs> and I say that half jokingly in that you could be Sam Hartman's roommate, you could be his best friend, or you could be, you know, a, a first-year freshman and if you make a mistake during a game on the field, you miss an assignment, you don't run a route clean, you miss a block, he's going to chew you out the same regardless of who you are because it's his huddle. It's it's He knows it's his offense to carry right now. They've got a lot of talent at the, school, at the skill positions, but he knows it's not going to go anywhere without him. Like I said, Mitch Griffiths, a lot of talent, great to look at in the future, but right now you're not going to get anywhere this season without Sam Hartman taking the snaps. Nope. Yeah, that was a long game, very physical game, too. Anytime mm-hmm. that you're playing Clemson, that's how it's going to be. you got to be to that level, and that's right. something we've always known from being down here in Tallahassee. What is what is the team feeling like? I mean, the health-wise, any injuries to keep an eye on, any guys that we've heard that have been limited or guys that went down against Clemson that we're still going to have to wait till Saturday for availability because I know at least here in Tallahassee, You'll never get any word about who's going to be out there on Saturday per Mike Norvell. You will not know that. You just kind of got to – we'll know it and see that practice, but can't say anything about it. What is the uh, outlook on at least health-wise for Wake Forest coming into this game after a really long, extensive overtime game? It's, it's funny you say that because Mark and I have joked about this. And, you know, in my in my professional years at last we're on college football, I've covered SMU under Sonny Dykes. Mm-hmm. I've covered UCLA under Jim Mora and Chip Kelly. Um, they all have, and now I've got Wake Forest. You know, every school has different policies, right, on what you can and can't do. When we were at UCLA, you could be there at practice and go on your Twitter feed and say, hey, running back Joe Smith has a boot on his right foot and is working out with the trainers. Chip Kelly, now when you would ask Chip Kelly, what's his status or what's his injury, he would just say he's unavailable. That was his two words for because, you know, include, including the contraction in there, he's unavailable for everything, everybody, ever. Go on to Wake Forest, and we could see guys working out with the trainers and not practicing. We're not allowed to mention them. They may as well be in the witness protection program. Um, you know, when Sam Hartman, after he had his vascular surgery, and we all pretty much knew what it was and what was going on uh, because we could physically see the remnants of the surgery, uh, we weren't even allowed to discuss whether he was even showing up a practice to, to help the team and talk with the team. It was, you know, so it really is that I'll say this based on, 
based on the last game, you're going to want to keep an eye on Kalen Carson. We don't know his status, but he got banged up in the last game. So you're going to want to keep an eye on his availability. Um, but I think everybody else came out of it in pretty good health. Before we continue on talking about this week with Wake Forest, obviously, mm-hmm. Logan, we have to do something real quick. We haven't done this before. Can you give me a four? four can you give me a four and O quality reason why we should hit the like button? No, uh, hit the like button and then <laughs> Tony, this is how it goes. But if you hit if you hit the like button, then Florida State will win on Saturday. It's been working since the very beginning <laughs> of the season. It's been working, so I don't know. We don't have as much people on tonight, but hopefully we get the hundred likes. It might help. But yeah, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, so then no. you'll be uh with us every Wednesday, evening I- like this. I don't think we have as many people on because I don't know, Tony, I don't know if you saw this, but Miami got spanked by Middle Tennessee State. So uh, I saw been, it. We have a lot of Miami haters who like to come on and make fun of Florida State, but I don't know, maybe they all threw their computers into <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe it's going to wash up or something, maybe up in the north central Florida or something. But Yeah, you know, not 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 to pile no. on, but, but, I did, on, but I did see where, you know, I uh, saw some comments earlier today that, that – you know, maybe the government, maybe the mm-hmm. governor of Florida should should take on some of the Middle Tennessee staff because, you know, they know how to deal with hurricanes. So, uh, yeah. you know, get out of Hurricane Ian pretty quickly. Hire some folks from Middle Tennessee State. All right, our, our thoughts and prayers to the, to the to those of us, obviously, who are dealing with the storm down here in Florida. Our of thoughts course. And prayers to the Miami Hurricane football team for getting snapped back into reality. Yeah. Tom- Tony, can you go into, obviously, Sam Hartman? He's got a lot of targets, and we saw that sure. against Clemson yep. right off the bat. I mean, throughout yep. that whole game, like you said, he matched his school record there with the touchdown throws. Who are some names that FSU fans, and if you can give us the numbers too, because a lot of them are still going to be in the stands on Saturday, who are some names that we should keep an eye out on that Sam likes to go to quite a bit? Because Florida State throughout their practices this, this week – and then they did it again in LSU prep too, but the defensive backs have played really, really nice uh, the last mm-hmm. two days, and they've got a big game coming up. They, they've they've got to play like this in practices, or it's just going to be a long day against Wake because Sam Hartman is one of the best, if not the best, in the ACC competing with Jordan Travis right now. Right, this is going to be a phenomenal game. If you like probably scoring, if you like scoring, this uh, this, this is it. And you know, uh, two quarterbacks that are playing exceptional football right now in 2022 but who are some names to keep an eye out on on the offensive side on saturday inside doak yeah i think one of the things that from if you're watching wake forest for the first time one of the things you want to look at is they don't have a a receiver a go-to guy that's going to get the majority of the receptions they've got three of them in the wide out position um if you ask dave clausen he's got three starting wide outs because they'll tell you, you can put them in a bag, throw around the bag, pick one out, and he's happy with whomever you picked out. So um, you're going to see a lot of Donovan Green, who missed all of last season when he blew out his knee in camp. It's funny, talking to talking to Donovan during camp, his upper body strength was always something that people just you know were startled at. And he would say his weak spot was his legs. Well, he had to rehab the knee, so now his legs are tremendously strong. And and you wanted the number, so uh, number eleven, Donovan Green is going to be someone you're going to want to look for. At Perry, number nine, is the guy who gets the headlines, who you know was on the Bolitnikov watch list, and he's a guy who's going to go downfield and you know beat defensive backs, uh, you know down the sidelines. Sorry if you hear the cat screaming. <laughs> Logan's cat comes on the show all the time. I saw that earlier. Yeah, yeah. she'll be back here soon. Yeah, apparently, apparently, uh, show here. Apparently, cat, Gus. Yeah, apparently. yeah, apparently, Gus doesn't think he's getting enough TV time, of but not. he'll he'll deal with it. Um, but there there was a guy that has really, I, I hate to say he's the breakout guy because mm-hmm. he had a really good camp, he had a really good spring, he's been good. He's just elevated his game as number eighty, Jamal Banks. He had a huge game against Clemson. He was really Hartman's main target against Clemson. So those are the three guys, you know, on the wide out. Um, they use slot receivers. They use Keyshawn Williams and, and Taylor Moore in, on, you know, in the slot. They're both really good. Um, sorry, you wanted the numbers. Number two for Moore and, and uh, number 13 for Williams. So and, and they're very, very good slot receivers. 
you know, in that that'll go over the middle. And then you got Blake Whitehart, the tight end. So he's got a lot of options. They don't throw to the running backs very much. These guys are guys who are going to carry the ball. The offense just doesn't really, you're not going to see a lot of, of, you know, throws in the flat to a running back. You're not going to see running backs running a short wheel route, things like that. It's, just, it's not part of the offense. There, there's a little bit of a misnomer with Wake's offense because they oftentimes run this thing called the slow mesh. And if you've never seen it before, it looks weird because it looks like a slow developing play where no one knows what they're doing. It's intentional. What it does is it moves everything up to the line of scrimmage. Even though Hartman's taking the snap and the shotgun, the running backs next to him and behind them, everybody is up at the line of scrimmage. It forces the linebackers to commit either to protecting the pass and, and taking on the tight end or a receiver, or you've got the running back, you know, open up the middle if you know, whichever. So it forces some action from the linebackers and then they react to the linebackers. There's a little bit of a misnomer that that is Wake Forest's offense. I will tell you reality, they use it about 25, maybe 30% of the time, and the rest of it is pretty much a straight-up RPO type of offense. Tony, for the most part of the first 30 seasons that Florida State was in the ACC, mm-hmm. Florida State dominated this series. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, was a, there was a three-game stretch from 06, 07, and 08 uh, where Wake Forest won. Wake Forest has gotten a couple wins uh, ever since then, but we all saw what happened last year. We, we mm-hmm. saw Wake Forest just absolutely dominate Florida State. I think it's safe to say this is a different Florida State team that Wake Forest will see absolutely. come Saturday night. What absolutely. is Wake Forest's mindset about Florida State? What What is Wake Forest thinking? C- comparing you're seeing a, a Florida State team that essentially quit last season when the two teams played in Winston-Salem to a Florida State team that's coming into this game as a, a nearly a touchdown favorite. Yeah, I'll tell you, Dave Clawson is – really impressed with the job Mike Norvell has done. He, he said so yesterday. He said Norvell has probably done the best job of any coach in the country of taking the guys that he inherited, whether guys who were already on the roster, guys who were already committed in the recruiting class, were already coming in, and blending them with filling the needs via the transfer portal filling in those gaps. And he said Norvell's done a better job than anyone else in the country at doing that and knowing where his needs were and being able to fill those gaps. So Clawson is really impressed. You know, obviously the 4-0 start opens a lot of eyes. I know there were a lot of people who thought maybe they shouldn't have beaten Louisville, but you know what? I saw the game and I, I, I see you're one of them. And I, and I get that, but you know what? The good teams pull out games that perhaps they wouldn't have pulled out in the past. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm-hmm. that's a game where Florida State two years ago or last year wouldn't, might, probably wouldn't have won the game. Mm-hmm. You're a better team because you got challenged, you got pushed to the wall, and you still won the game. Um, Clawson also had was very complimentary of Jordan Travis, and obviously anybody who watches as much college football as we do, you're going to be complimentary of Jordan Travis. The guy's completing, what, 66% of his passes right mm-hmm. now. Um, is in total control of the offense. And Clawson talked about how physically gifted Travis is, that he's really ramped up his game. He's ramped up his ability to run Norvell's offense without really any mistakes, any, you know, a- any mental errors that looks like he doesn't understand where he is or what he's doing. Every, every quarterback makes mistakes. But it's clear that Travis is comfortable in the offense, comfortable in what he's doing, feels at ease running the offense, and it's made a huge difference. And Clawson talked about that yesterday. Clawson also opened his mouth and talked about a certain thing that I, I feel will, will bring up that must be brought up because obviously, you know, the state of Florida is going through a lot of stuff right now with Hurricane Ian. Sure. And Clawson made comments where he had said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm not looking at it right now, that I hope the ACC will make the right decision. If the ACC doesn't make the right decision, then then we will. To a lot of people, that thought, that gave the impression that if, if the ACC was not to move the game, which it would involve a lot of schedule moving because you know, Florida State and Wake Forest do not share a common buy Correct. Week the rest of the season. And so it would have had to move. It would have had to happen a lot earlier in the week. 
there was a thought that when Florida and UCF moved their games to Sunday, maybe Florida State and Wake Forest would get moved to Sunday as well. Uh, but the, the weather forecast looks like 30% chance of rain in Tallahassee, but it looks like it's going to be clear skies. There's going to, there's obviously questions about fans like me from South Florida heading up to Tallahassee. I'm going to make the drive up. A lot of other people will. Sure. So I guess my question to you is this, do you believe as somebody who covers Wake Forest that Dave Clawson would legitimately forfeit this game if he did not think it was safe, I guess? I think Probably not, but I don't want to say certainly not. Look, and, and and I saw, you know, social media went crazy last night. I was live tweeting from his press conference. Um, you know, I'm sitting there. When you watch the press conference, you can see him looking one way or the other, and he's looking over here in this direction. That was me, you know, asking okay. these questions. And 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 because the issue was who's who's whose control is this? And it's in the hands of the ACC and Florida State. There was a notion of, I guess, and, and I guess let's just take it down item by item real quick if we mm. can. Um, moving it to Sunday was never going to be a good option for Wake Forest because they got to play Army next week. It's already hellacious having to prepare for Army, a game which mystifies me why they keep it on the schedule, mm -hmm. especially in the middle of the season. Goodness gracious, get rid of that game in the future. Um, but doing it on a shortened week, if you move this Florida State game to Sunday, creates an even bigger problem. I think in terms of the moving the game, what was being looked at, and this is my own speculation, this is – you know, not not coming from Clawson, but my own talking to other people is on Monday when the storm was still gathering and was still an unknown as to its 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 uh, outcome of where it was going to take land was move the game somewhere else, put it in Birmingham, put it in somewhere in Alabama that was going to be dry, put it in, you know. Louisiana, wherever, go to Tulane, wh whatever the case may be, right? And that was what was meant by moving it. Now, what Clawson took a lot of heat for yesterday was he said, if the ACC doesn't make the right decision, we will. Context and content is important because what was said next was we need to look at everything, not just we don't want to play this game. It's if we go down there, what is the status of the city? In other words, is there flooding in the city? Is there is our hotel going to have electricity, or there's or there going to be power outages? Is the is the place where we are going to be able to fully function to feed our team and our staff? You know, and the hotel will have electricity. Are we pulling first responders from somewhere else where they should be? If they're needed elsewhere in the city, because you know maybe maybe the city gets hit with wind or power outages, and we're pulling them for the game, because you've got to have you know 50, 60 cops at the game, you know medics, first responders. It was that that he was talking about, and that if he doesn't feel that the team can get down there safe and stay down there safely, then Wake Forest needs to you know needs to have a conversation with itself and discuss its options. It was never, if they don't cancel, then we will. I think that kind of got blown up. Part of what part of what does, again, looking in context is, Florida State, at least to some degree, was worried enough that they canceled classes on Thursday and Friday and canceled the homecoming you know, celebration. But within an hour or two after issuing that statement, they then said, we're playing the game at 3.30. So there was a little bit of a, oh, well, okay, which is it? I think at this point, and look, obviously the most important thing is the thoughts and prayers to everybody who lives in the state of Florida who's, who's being impacted by that. I've got friends there. Um, just before we went on air, I was checking in with a couple of our writers uh, who live in South Florida and one who lives in, in Tampa, and they just lost power. And, you know, so... Those kinds of things matter much more than the football game. And I think Clawson was looking at it as there's a bigger picture than just can we play the football game or, you know, it's, you know, what's what's the picture in terms of the status of the city? Is there going to be electricity? Is there going to be things that we can do to take care of our team? And I think it went crazy last night. No. 
and I, I agree with you to a certain extent, Tony, is, you know, well, on Monday, on Sunday and Monday, this storm looked like it was going to hit the Big Bend region mm-hmm. uh, closer to Tallahassee at 2 o'clock in the morning Friday, mm-hmm. which if that happens, the game gets either moved, canceled. Thing, th- there were possibilities of Wake Forest moving their game to Boston College, which is scheduled on October 22nd. Right. Up to this week, this game would have been moved to that October 22nd weekend. Right. That would have been great for Florida State. But there were options that could have been in play. No one saw this storm literally saying, you know what, Fort Myers and Charlotte County look good. Let me turn right here and just head sure. up the, the central part of the state of Florida. I think sure. what Clawson is getting the heat for was the comment, of, and, and I, I agree with you, context does matter on this one, is saying if the ACC doesn't make the decision, we will. Because I feel like he's trying to put that pressure on the ACC to say, oh, well, well, we should cancel this game. Or, or if the, neither team's in the ACC championship game, they can play it on December 3rd at 12 o'clock in Tallahassee. I, I just it, it comes across that way. And, but I do agree with you, and I think there, there will be first responders sent from the Panhandle, from cities like Pensacola, from Tallahassee, from Panama City, who will be sent to the central part of the state, the mm-hmm. southwest part of the state. That, that's just what we do in the state. Right. But sure. I, think, I think you look at it, and I think Tallahassee is going to be just fine weather-wise, but I feel like if Lawson had just been a little clearer with that, he wouldn't be taking nearly as much heat. I agree. I think what happens is maybe it's clarity, maybe it isn't. It's that five-second, ten-second pause after yeah. saying that before going on to the rest of, of that comment that makes it you know easy fodder for for social media people to just hear that part of it and and not necessarily hear the rest because um yeah look i mean and our reporting today you know when we're talking doing a preview of the game that we published this afternoon we had gotten some information from uh uh leon county emergency services that got sent to us overnight when I sent in a request last night for some updates as to, you know, their status. Um, and basically they were like, you know, look, we understand it's going to hit far South of us and make land. We may not even get very much rain. We are worried about the high winds. We are worried about what that does to the electricity. We're preparing as if we are in an emergency status, just so we're prepared. Um, and we checked back about an hour before uh, we published and just to see if there had been any change. And their thing was we are still going off what we sent out, you know, earlier this morning. So I don't think that's being alarmist whatsoever. I think it's showing that Leon County says, look, we're prepared. We know what we could be getting. We're not going to get the drenching that other parts of the state are getting. We could be getting stuff from the outer bands and the high winds. We're prepared for that. Um, and we'll we'll deal accordingly as things change. I think you know. Look, you guys are more experienced at this than I am. I came from California. I got earthquake and fire experience. Okay. You guys, you guys have hurricane experience. As as the storm changes, as you pointed out, it changed dramatically from what it was Monday to what it is as we air this right now. So. I think, you know, you look back and it was 24 hours ago, a little bit, you know, probably 28 hours ago that Clawson made those comments and the storm was in a different path then than it, than it went overnight when it, you know, took a hard turn, you know, east and so on. So um, it's, um, I, like I said, I, I, I tend to cut him a little bit of slack, not because I'm covering him. I don't, <laughs> Mark knows, I don't cut slack to coaches I cover, not ever. Um Chip Kelly was probably more than happy to see me leave town would probably would have helped me pack if I had asked him. Um, but I think it's, if you look at the big picture, it wasn't, we want to cancel It's We just want to make sure big picture is not just about, can we go play a football game? It's, are we safe down there? Are we pulling resources from something else? You know, are we going to wind up in a hotel that then loses power for, you know, 24 hours, that kind of stuff. So I think it was really that in the broader scheme. Yeah, I don't think too much of it. I think we got a football game to be played on Saturday. That's all that matters. Uh, I think it was just early, early talk. And with forecasts, things can turn quick. And, you know, 
Dave, Dave's just getting ready for a game and making sure his players are safe. So that's all I think about it. But right now, it's game on no matter what. Florida State and Wake Forest are going to go at it 3.30 primetime afternoon. Two ACCs going at it. So that's all I got for it. One well, question you, and, I wanna... and, you, and you make a good point, just real quick, is yeah. that Clawson said, look, let's understand. We're preparing our team to play. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he, he also got trashed for making a comparison to the COVID years. And, again, people didn't really understand what he was saying. And maybe maybe he didn't say it well enough, but it was during during 2020, we went every week not knowing if we were going to play or not. So you had to prepare as though you were going to play because the minute you take 20 minutes off and think, well, we're probably not going to play anyway, you're unprepared and you're going to get beat. That was his analogy. But I saw a lot of social media, people, oh, trying to compare COVID to the hurricane. No, it's not it at all. What he was talking about was the preparation mindset that you got to go in and spend every waking moment you've got preparing because the minute you take some of that time off because you're watching the weather channel, you're you're going to wind up getting beat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One question real quick. Sure. On y'all side and, and Wake Forest side, what is the biggest threat to Wake Forest going into this game, do you think, on FSU side? What do you think – from what you've seen from FSU where you're like, this is a matchup I'm keeping a close eye on, or maybe FSU has an edge here that Wake Forest is going to have to play better on. I think it's how – I think it's I think it's the defensive line for Wake Forest being able to finish or not finish in the Florida State backfield. Um, they got a lot of pressure last week on DJ Uyunglele and you know look DJ lost 30 pounds in the off season and you know theoretically he's a little bit more fleet of foot although if you look at the guy you know his calves are still as big as tree trunks um he's just physically that big hey 30 pounds lighter you think it'd be easier to bring down but what you saw was guys getting their hands on him in the backfield and him still escaping to keep plays alive um you know Wake has got Rondell Bothroyd, who is turning out to be just an outstanding defensive lineman. Um, guys like Deion Bergen um, and um, Kobe Turner being able to get in the backfield, but actually finish the play. And I think Travis Jordan presents a problem for Wake Forest because he is athletic enough and he is elusive enough that if you don't get him down, if you don't, You've got to try and get him down on that first contact. You know, you watch his game film and he doesn't go down on first contact. He doesn't go down just because you're grabbing at his jersey. Um, if if the Wake Forest defensive line can't get the penetration and finish plays in the backfield, it's potentially a long day for them. Tony, we're going to finish up strong here real quick. Yeah. Give us your prediction. Go. He's on the spot. All right. Um, Remember what show you're on. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Remember the show. All right. Look, I think there's going to be a lot of points put up. I think I'm looking at about a 38 34 Florida State win. I was just kidding. You can pick Wake if you want to. I was really. Trying. I I I think I think Wake is going to have a hard time with all the distractions of the week. You can say that they weren't distractions, but they were um, coming back from last week. And I will tell you that this is a must win for mm -hmm. for Wake. You can't lose divisional games back to back weeks like this. You just you can't. And so um, it's a must win game. I think it stays close the entire way. I think I think one of the determining factors will be Wake cannot have the slow start in the first quarter that they've had for the past couple of weeks. You can't. Florida State will big up. You know, will 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 put up big numbers early, and you're playing the catch up the rest of the game. So, you know, I think Wake Forest. Let me, let me, and let me say this: I think Wake Forest can beat Florida State. I think physically they can match up with Florida State. I think at the skill positions. They can match up with Florida State. But my gut, since you put me on the spot right okay. now, says 38-34 Florida State. You still got to wait covering. Logan, what you got? I'm, I'm in that range too, but just one point closer. I think it's going to be closer just by one, but I got 34-31. Florida State 
just the advantage here. And it usually goes by this if it's just three point win is home advantage. I think that's mm-hmm. just the biggest thing for FSU going into this game right now. And there's the weather looks to be fine. I think the wind talk needs to go ahead and go ahead and squash that. It's 10 to 15 miles per hour. That's not going to take away from Sam Hartman, Dave Kloss, and wanting to go for the dagger a couple times, go for the throat. Uh, you don't have to have to worry about the wind. Florida State's defensive backs have to play good in this game. Uh, they're still going to throw it no matter, you know, no matter. I don't think the wind's going to be a factor. So looking at it right now, uh, and Sam Hartman is a lethal threat there at quarterback. One thing that I'm worried about, you're still going to rely on Derek McLendon and Pat Payton here. Losing Jared Verse, I think we're going to find out Florida State's going to hurt in this one on that. So, But I still have Florida State winning. I, I just think being at home is going to help quite a bit. Mark talked about this before, about how important of a game this is for Florida State. This is the three-game stretch of Florida State. You start off 4-0. Florida State has to win one of these next three games, Wake Forest, NC State, or Clemson, to be at a point where you're 5-2 and two going into the bye week, got a bad Georgia Tech team coming out, and you could possibly – possibly be bowl eligible before the month of November starts. That would be huge for this Florida State team. I think, Tony, love you as a guest. You've been phenomenal at the times you've been on here, but I think Wake is the easiest of the three teams at this mm-hmm. point right now. I think that's why it's so important Florida State plays Wake for us now, coming off a loss when they're a little bit like the, the wounded bird, I guess you would say. I'm going to say Florida State 35, Wake Forest 31, And I'm only going to say that because that means Florida State doesn't attempt any field goals because I'm tired of watching Brian Fitzgerald miss field goals. I'm sick and tired. Four for four today with the wind gusts. That's fine, but not watching them. But literally (laughs) having my back turned to the TV and hearing, and a missed field goal for Florida State. I've had that enough in my life. I'm done with it. Ryan, stay on the sideline. Just attempt a couple extra points. You should be able to make those. That's all I'm saying. Although he did miss one last week. That's all I'm saying. Tired of it. I'm tired of it. You guys are all in the same range here, like in the 30s, three to four mm-hmm. point game. Across the board. This is not like the Wake Forest teams that Florida State used to annihilate back in the day. Right. Wake Forest oh, is a I, good team. I know team. who they are. Right. Wake <laughs> Forest is a very good team. Uh, but th- that's why I think this is the this is why Florida State. We want them right now. 